Welcome to lecture number two for ECE 320 Electronics 1, Complex Numbers and Phasers. Now this lecture covers material that you should have covered in Circuits 1, but it's fundamental and will be used extensively in electronics, so we'll go over it. Complex numbers are something that electrical engineers live and breathe with. The reason being is when you have a sine wave. I need two numbers to represent a given sine wave. I've got a sine term and a cosine term. Or I can also do it in polar form. I have an amplitude and a delay. Complex numbers give me that. They have two degrees of freedom that allows me to represent a generic sine wave. Now the heart of complex number is the concept of J. In math they call I, but for us I means current, so electrical engineers call it J. J is the square root of minus one, meaning that J squared is minus one. There's also Euler's identity. If I have a complex exponential, it's got a real part and a complex part. The real part is cosine of the angle. The complex part is j times the sine of the angle. Now, in general, a complex number has two terms. In rectangular form, I can represent it as a plus jb. Or in polar form, r at angle theta. And r at angle theta, what that means is it is amplitude r times e to the j theta. But e to the j theta is kind of hard to write, so we just do r angle theta. So that means the same thing. The conversion you kind of see from trigonometry. The hypotenuse, or r, is the square root of a squared plus b squared. The angle, tangent of the angle, is b over a. So you can convert from rectangular to polar, polar to rectangular fairly easily. Again, this is where the HP calculator really, really shines. With the HP calculator, to input a complex number, I've got this term called complex. And under modes, I can switch between rectangular and polar. So I do rectangular, and I do 1, enter 2, complex. That means 1 plus J2. To convert to polar, I just have to do modes polar. That's also equal to 2.2 at 63 degrees. With the HP, can also input a number in polar form. If I have the number 7 at an angle of 33 degrees, since I'm in modes polar, I'm in polar form, it interpreted 733 as 7 angle 33 degrees. I cannot convert back to rectangular. That's also the same thing as 5.8 plus J3.8. So the HP calculator lets you flip between polar and rectangular really easily. And you can also input the number in either form. Now a couple definitions. The real part of a complex number is the real part. The complex part is the complex part, kind of obviously. On the HP calculator, I can pull those out if I'm in rectangular mode and do complex again. That pulls out the real part and the complex part. Do it a second time, it takes x and y, converts it to the real complex part. The amplitude is the amplitude. The angle is the angle. And there's the thing called the complex conjugate. What the complex conjugate is, is take the complex part, change the sign. And what that does for you is if I take a complex number, so enter, change the sign of the complex part. A number times its complex conjugate is the real squared plus complex squared. And notice there's no imaginary part. That's the magnitude squared. Algebra with complex numbers. Complex numbers can be added, subtracted, multiplied, divided, just like real numbers. When you add a complex number, the real part adds, the complex part adds. For example, if I do 5, enter 2, complex, 1, enter 3, complex. When I add them together, the real part adds, that'll give me 6. Complex part adds, that'll give me 5. 6 plus j5. Likewise, when you subtract, 3, enter 4, complex, 6 minus 3 is 3, 5 minus 4 is 1. So addition and subtraction are pretty straightforward in rectangular form. You can also do it in polar form. It's not quite as obvious what's going on, but it does work. 
for example, if we do pull node polar, if I do uh, 5, enter 5 at 20 degrees, plus 4 at 30 degrees, add them together, I get something. It's easier to see what's going on in rectangular form, but you do get a complex number. You can also multiply complex numbers. When you do that, um, again, you can do some algebra. I get a times c <clears throat> plus j squared times b times d uh, gives you the minus sign. Complex parts, b times c, a times d. So you get a complex number. It's actually easier to see in polar form. In polar form, the amplitude multiplies, the angles add. So again, if I have, make sure I'm in polar form. If I have 5 at 20 degrees, multiply by 3 at 30 degrees. When I multiply, I'll get 15 at 50 degrees. <clears throat> also works in rectangular form. Example 3 plus j1 times 2 plus j1. Multiply it together, I get a complex number. This is where the HPs really shine. HPs do complex numbers very easily. A whole lot easier than having to multiply all this out by hand. What I really want is a calculator that works. HPs work with complex numbers. You can divide complex numbers. And here the trick to do it by hand is to multiply the top and bottom by the complex conjugate of the denominator. That gives you c squared plus d squared. Then I'm multiplying two complex numbers. And the result is a complex number. Whatever just happened there. So again, if I do, like, what is 3 plus j1 divided by 2 plus j1, take the ratio, it's a complex number. It's actually easier to see in polar form. If I have 5 at 30 degrees, okay, 50 at 30 degrees, um, let's do 10 at 20 degrees. When I divide, it'll be 50 over 10, 5 at the difference, 5 at 10 degrees. From my standpoint, as long as your calculator gets the right answer, I don't care how it does it, but this is how it does it. There's Euler's identity. Euler's identity says that e to the jx is cosine x plus j sine of x. From that, I can do some algebra, and I get cosine is e to the jx plus e to the minus jx over 2, and sine is e to the jx minus e to the minus jx over 2j. That's important, especially when you get to communications. If I have a sine wave for audio signal, that's your, your 20 to 20 kilohertz. See? Anytime I have an audio signal, I also, also have its complex conjugate. When I modulate it, say with AM radio, and make it uh, 1 megahertz, AM radio broadcast, I'm going to get the upper side band and the lower side band. Um, so again, anytime you have a sine wave, I've got two numbers the complex part and its complex conjugate. But again, it's a different course, communications. Phasers. With complex numbers, I can represent sine waves. And really the reason we want to do this is if I have a circuit with DC signals, I can use real numbers. Once I get to sine waves, I really need to use complex numbers. To represent a voltage, what I do is note that Euler's identity says e to the j omega t is cosine omega t plus sine omega t. If I look at the real part, um, I just get cosine. So 1 times e to the j omega t, this point right here, that means cosine. If I take e to the j omega t times a complex number, a plus jb, multiply it out, the real part will be a times cosine. Then I'll have a j times j. j squared is minus 1. Minus b times sine. Plus a complex part. If I just take the real part, I get a cosine minus b times sine. That's the phase of representation for a, a sine wave. The real part means cosine. 
the complex part means minus sine. So the single complex number, I can represent both the cosine term and the sine term. And what you really need to remember, we'll be doing this over and over again, the real part is cosine minus j is sine. That's in rectangular form. In polar form, it's actually a little bit more obvious. The amplitude is the amplitude. The phase shift is the delay. So, with phasers, I can represent a generic sine wave. So suppose I had the sine wave, I want to represent it in phasor form. I need to know the frequency, the cosine term, and the sine term. Or in polar form, I need to know the amplitude and the angle. Well, the frequency you can get just by one over the period. Uh, frequency is one over the period. The period I can measure, say peak to peak, that distance is 50 milliseconds. So the frequency is 20 hertz. Hertz are cycles per second. Uh, note that the natural units are radians per second. So I need to multiply by 2 pi to get to radians per second. So label your answers. If I call it 20 hertz, it's correct. Uh, let's see. To determine the amplitude, again, that would just be this point right here. The amplitude is that distance. Looks like the amplitude is 14. The angle is the delay. If this is t equals 0 right here, cosine is the peak at t equals 0. This peak isn't at t equals 0. It's delayed by 13 milliseconds. So I want to find out what is that angle. Well, this right here is 360 degrees. That's one period. This is my angle, my delay. So the angle is your delay. Uh, let's see, 13 milliseconds. That percentage, uh, 50 milliseconds. And one cycle is 360 degrees. I'd use 2 pi if I want to use radians per second. I personally like degrees. So working that out, I've got 13 milliseconds over 50 milliseconds times 360 is 93 degrees. And a delay is a negative phase shift. So that voltage is represented as 14 at minus 93 degrees. That's the polar form. If I want to represent that in rectangular form, I would do 14, enter 93, polar form, and rectangular form, that's the same thing as minus 0.73, minus j 13.98. So that'd be minus 0.73 cosine omega t plus 13.98 sine omega t, where omega is 20 hertz, or 20 times 2 pi radians per second. So with phasers, I can represent a generic voltage. With phasers, I can represent impedances. Now, if I just have a resistor circuit, I only need real numbers. Once I add capacitors and inductors, I need complex numbers. The impedance of a resistor is just R. For AC, it's also R. For a capacitor, the impedance is 1 over J omega C. Where that comes from is the current. The basic relation for a capacitor is I equals C dV dt. Uh, assuming Everything's in the form of e to the j omega t. That's the basic assumption for phasers. Take the derivative, I get j omega, e to the j omega t. Pulling the j omega outside, I get j omega c times e to the j omega t, which is v. From v equals i r, that must be 1 over r. So r is 1 over j omega c for capacitors. For inductors, the basic equation is V equals L D I D T. Again, assuming that I is in the form of E to the J, J omega T. When I differentiate, I get J omega, E to the J omega T, or J omega L times I. So the impedance of an inductor is J omega L. With that, I can find the impedance of a RLC circuit at a given frequency using complex numbers.
So AC analysis is just like DC analysis, except you need to use complex numbers. For example, if I have complex impedances in series, they add, and parallel, they add as the sum of the inverses. If I have this circuit, a capacitor is going to be 1 over j omega c. If I multiply by j over j, that gives you minus j over omega c. Capacitors have an impedance of minus j. Inductors have an impedance of plus j. Again, capacitors are different than inductors. This is a minus j, that's a plus j. Given a circuit with capacitors, inductors, and resistors, I can find the net impedance. It's going to be a complex number. And to find it, I just need to use the same thing we did before, uh, resistors in series and parallel, only now with complex numbers. So let's take a couple of minutes, try to solve for this circuit, find the total impedance. And picking up, again, this is where the HP calculators really shine. They do complex numbers really well. I personally prefer rectangular mode. I've got 300 in series with 200. Those add. So that's 300 in series with 200. Gives you 300 plus J200. That's in parallel with J400. In parallel, the inverses add. So take that inverse. 0, enter 400. That's J400. Take it, its inverse. Add them together. So all this together gives you 106 plus J186 ohms. In series with minus J100, 0, enter 100. There's minus J100. In series, they add. And parallel with 500. So take it, that inverse, 500, inverse, add the inverses, take the inverse. The total is 96 plus J57. And that's really where the HP calculators shine. Complex numbers, real numbers, they don't care. They work just fine for both of them. Um, the other calculators, like TIs, really struggle on this kind of math. So this is kind of where uh, the HPs are worth 10 points on midterms. With an HP, I can grind through this problem really quickly. Other calculators won't be quite so fast. For example, if this is a midterm, here's the problem, find the impedance, go. That'd be 300 enter 200, complex, in parallel with 400, J400. In series with minus J100, in parallel with 500, done. Now, I defy anybody with a TI calculator to keep up with that. So again, I would highly recommend getting HP calculators. The free 42 is free, hence the name. The other calculators you can get, like the HP 35, is I think 50 bucks on Amazon. Uh, definitely worth getting. With complex numbers, everything that you did at DC now works at AC. For example, suppose I had this circuit, I want to find out what is this voltage. Well, I could use voltage division. First, I want to take the circuit and replace it with this complex equivalent. The resistor doesn't change. The capacitor becomes 1 over j omega c. So omega is 20. So I'm going to take 0 0.01, 0 0.001 times 20. This is minus j50 ohms. The voltage source becomes 10 plus j0. That's 10 cosine, 0 sine. So here's my circuit. Now use voltage division. It's going to be your R1 over R1 plus R2 times Vn. So that'd be R1, 0, enter 50. That's your R1. I'm going to hit enter a couple times because I want to rem remember that. R1 plus R2, add 100 to it. And this is why I hit enter a couple times because it remembered the R1. There's your R1 plus R2. Take the ratio times 10. There's my answer, 2 minus J4. And what that means is the real part's cosine, 
minus the sine part is your minus j term. So that's minus minus or plus 4. If I had two terms here, uh, for example, let's make this 10 cosine of 20t plus 20 sine about 12. If I had that as my input, same problem. Except now I represent this as 10 minus j20. Cosine part is 10, okay, 10 minus j12. Another 12. 10 minus j12. The sine term is 12. So it would be the same procedure as before. I would take your r1, 0, enter, negative 50, complex. There's your r1. r2 is 100. Take the ratio times the input. Now the input is 10 minus j12. Now the answer is minus 2.8 minus j6.4, meaning that my answer is minus 2.8 cosine of 20t plus 6.4 sine of 20t. So again, I don't really care with complex numbers. The input is going to be complex number. Real parts cosine minus j is sine. Everything we did at DC still applies. I'm just now using complex numbers. In Circuit Lab, the polar form actually shows up better. Converting that to polar, uh, again, 2 minus j4. is 4.4 at minus 63 degrees. The polar form is what shows up in Circuit Lab. It's also what you'll see in Lab if you build it. Build this in Circuit Lab, do a time domain simulation. Again, what I would do is uh, one cycle is 20 milliseconds. So let's run it. No. The frequency is 20 ratings per second divided by 2 pi. It's 3.18 hertz. The period is about 300 milliseconds, so let's run it for about three cycles. Uh, run it for one second. If I run it for one second, I'll make the time steps about a thousand times smaller, uh, like one millisecond. That'll give me a thousand points on the plot. And look at V0 and V1. So here's V0. Here's V1. And notice that V1 is delayed at lower in amplitude. If you pick out the amplitude, the peak is 4.47. That's the same thing I calculated, 4.47. In addition, there's a delay. The delay is your angle, the phase shift. Um, usually just care about amplitude, but both of them are actually in there. Here's the second problem. Suppose I have this circuit. Find y of t. Again, the trick is to convert to phasers. I've got 18.6 sine of 754t. Where that comes from is this is 60 hertz. The real part's cosine minus j is sine. So the voltage is minus j 18.6. The inductor becomes j omega l. So 0 0.2 times 754 is 150 times j. Capacitor becomes 1 over j omega c minus j 26 ohms and 100 ohms. Now let's use voltage division. Put these two in parallel. Let's go back to rectangular form. I've got 100 ohms in parallel with minus j26.5. Zero, enter, 26.5, negative. There's my minus j26.5. Put those in parallel. So this together gives you 6.56 minus j 24.76. That's your R1. The total voltage is going to be voltage division. R1 over R1 plus R2 times Vn. It's going to give you this one. R1 over R1 plus R2 times Vn. So there's your R1. Hit enter a couple times. R2 is minus j 150.8 plus j150.80, enter 150.8. There's your R2. Add them together, take the ratio, 
times the input. Zero, enter, 18.6. Multiply, there's your answer. So the real part is cosine minus j is sine. You can also use polar form if you want. I personally like rectangular form. Or actually, let's check. If you do like polar form, there, polar form. And circuit lab, I could check. Build the circuit. This is 754. Okay, correction. That is 120 hertz. Okay, let's take 754 divided by 2 pi. 120 hertz. And circuit lab input this is 120 hertz. Inductor, capacitor, resistor. Simulate it. One cycle is 8.3 milliseconds. So run it for like two cycles. Let's run it for about 20 milliseconds. So the period is 20 milliseconds. The time step I'll make a thousand times smaller. 20 microseconds. That gives me a thousand points on the plot. And a thousand points works pretty well in Circuit Lab. If I have more, I really won't see it and it takes longer to run. If I have a fewer, like only two points, I don't get a very good plot. So a thousand works out pretty well. Uh, plot V1 of T, I get the orange line. And if I pull off the peak, the peak is 3.77 volts. I calculated 3.77 volts. It matches up. In addition, there's the time delay. So this is a sine wave. Uh, let's see, where's t equals zero? Here's a zero crossing. So if I call that t equals zero, this is the peak. That's my delay. It's that percentage of one cycle. Here's one cycle times 360. That'll give you 752 degrees. So again, the angle does show up on the graph. That's your delay. Typically, I just care about amplitude, but they both are there. Complex number has a real part and a complex part. It has an amplitude and an angle. They both will show up in the graph. So here's the sample problem. Find V2 of t. Let's pause, give you a couple minutes to try to solve this one. Then we'll go over it. Okay, assuming you picked up, um, I want to represent this in phasor form. So my frequency is 400. My input is 0 minus J10. J mega L is 0.2 times 400. So this is J80 ohms. This is 1 over J mega C. So omega is 10 microfarads. 10 to the minus 6 times 400 ohms. That's omega C. Whenever that is 250, so this is minus J 250. Solve for V2. Now let's do voltage division. I want to put these two in parallel. So that's 100 ohms, take its inverse, minus J 250. Oops. Try that again. Zero, enter, 250. Take its inverse. So all this together gives you 86.2 minus J 34.48. An extra dot in there. Now do voltage division. So that one, enter, 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 15 plus J80. That's your R1 plus R2. Take the ratio, that percentage of the input. The input is 0 minus J10. Answer is V2 is minus 6.02 minus J5.81. 
And what that means is B2 of t is minus 6.02 cosine of 400t plus 5.81 sine of 400t. Again, the real part is cosine minus j of sine. So in summary, AC analysis of circuits is just like DC analysis, only now you're using complex numbers. The real part means cosine, minus j means sine. And for resistors, resistors become R, inductors become j omega L, capacitor becomes whatever j omega C, or minus j over omega C. Everything we did to DC now works at AC, only now I have to use complex numbers. That's lecture number two for ECE 320, Electronics 1.